My name is Joe Compton. I am an independent author and filmmaker and the executive producer here at Go and Be Now. I may know a lot of things, but that's because I never stop learning. I figured I wasn't alone in that. So I asked my friends and colleagues if they wouldn't mind giving us an hour of their time to each teach us something new. So, welcome to Indie Teachables 101, brought to you by the Speculative Fiction Academy. Do you like fantasy, podcasting, and screenwriting? Want to learn how to write them? The Speculative Fiction Academy is perfect for you. With five curriculum tracks and three ways to learn, you'll go beyond the fundamentals to hone your craft. Take the classes you want to take. Visit speculativefictionacademy.com to learn more. Tonight we welcome Sean Hillman. Sean is an indie author and writer who writes columns for N World RPG News and Reviews. He also runs the gaming track at Multiverse Convention and the science fiction track at Jordan Con. If you haven't guessed by now, Sean is an avid gamer, and we're here to talk tonight about RPG role playing games. The role playing marketplace grows on an annual basis of about 6 to 10% since 2015. And in 2021, it grew to about 20 million in total revenue gaming sales. Of that, you'd be surprised to know that about a third of that comes from independent gaming companies and independent games. So make out your favorite character sheet, find your favorite set of dice, and let's sit down and welcome Sean Hillman as he teaches us role-playing games. Hello, everybody. We've got a good crowd, Sean. Everybody's excited about this. This is good. cool. I love it. Welcome. Thank you for uh, being here and joining me. And uh, yeah, so, you know, role-playing games. We're going to have some fun here tonight. Yes, we are. Yeah, we're going to have some fun <laughs> with it. Uh, so um, I think that probably the easiest place to start uh, is to bust a few misconceptions right off the bat. Awesome. Um, so there's no doubt that D&D, Dungeons and Dragons, was the first official role-playing game. No doubts. Um, and we'll get to that. We'll get to that in just a moment. Um, but a lot of people think uh, it's just like when people say Coke to mean soda. <laughs> or um, they say um, Kleenex. Give me some Kleenex. Um, Dungeons and Dragons is a brand of role playing yeah. games. Actually, it's many different role playing games, and I'll I'll use it as an, that as an example in a little bit. Um, but it is not all role playing games by any stretch of the imagination. D and D is a game about hunting down monsters and killing them and taking their stuff. And I, you know, not everybody's into that, and I get that. So the folks who are like, "Well, I don't want to play that kind of game," no problem. There are thousands at this point of mm. role playing games, and um, a lot of them are uh, very much about community building. Uh, they're about relationships. Uh, people build or make games for trauma. Um, you'd be surprised at 
out in how uh, wide I can I, I can get very weird with this because my only experience with role playing games and and doing this and I'm not this is not sexual so nobody freak out I didn't <laughs> when I said weird I mean it's just an unusual thing you wouldn't think of as a role playing game. But I was I, I was a big big pro wrestling fan as a kid, and okay. I got introduced to the E Fed, which is kind of like you create your own wrestler, and you compete with other wrestlers, and you do promos against that wrestler, and it's like you got message boards and things like that. So it was an online version of a role playing game essentially, yep. and then the, the the dungeon master or the game master would take those promos and then they would write out a match. So it would be like they would be broadcasting like a WWE match and they would have a winner and there would be storylines that continue on and things like that too. So that's my introduction to role-playing games. So yeah, that's fantastic. I, I, can, I can relate to the idea of <laughs> everything is not what everybody thinks it is. Um, last year, I, in fact, I re, uh, or I didn't realize I was introduced to, uh, but have not played. Um, apparently, back in the early '80s, there was a Dallas. You know, this TV show. Uh -huh. <laughs> there was a Dallas role playing game. Whoa. I, I can only assume it was about uh, killing Jr. <laughs> uh, or it should have been about killing Jr. Um, but yeah, it was a Dallas role playing game. Um, That's interesting. Most of the big geek, uh, what we consider geek uh, IPs, uh, Marvel, DC. <laughs> um, uh, right, who killed JR? We don't know. Um, and uh, so, you know, Star Trek, Star Wars, Star Wars, especially that's a, uh -huh. that's a cute story I'll, I'll get to in a bit, too. Um, have uh, have role playing games associated with them, which you would, you would imagine. Mm -hmm. Um, but also, and hopefully, people will be uh, interested to know this is that, like you had mentioned in your the intro, there are a lot of independent. RPGs mm -hmm. out there, mm -hmm. one-offs, free RPGs. People are making pamphlet RPGs every day, <laughs> um, and I think that's one thing. Maybe the second biggest thing people don't realize is that I feel like at its best. Now, I love my big production RPGs too. Won't lie about that, but I think at its, at its when it's at its best, uh, role-playing games are uh, an underground indie type of experience, right? And there's a certain transgression to picking up the dice and pulling out the unhealthy snacks or the healthy snacks, whichever, um, and socializing with people in this, uh, not necessarily collaborative. Well, I mean, there's a certain degree of collaboration to it, but in this, this medium, right. And it's definitely, it's definitely an art form. It's definitely a medium. Uh, and I think it's, it's one that people don't appreciate quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, so let's talk a little bit about the history. So this is where, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of big personalities in the role playing game industry. Um, I've really only been privileged to meet, uh, like Ron Edwards, Ron is a big, uh, name in the indie side of things. Um, although he probably is cringing if he hears me say that. Um, but, uh. The, it's always been a lot of big personalities. Um, most people here, and I've heard the name Gary Gygax, um, a few less people probably heard Dave Arneson. And it's hard to know which one is the chicken and which one is the egg. I've uh, heard of Gary, for sure. Well, yeah, I, I think it's, it's probably the best way I can describe it is um, Arneson really took they took a lot from Arneson's actually play, right? Actual playing. Uh, and Gary Gygax and others, um, Dave Wesley, I think I was reminded today. Um, so Gary and TSR took that, put it together, and made that available in something that people could digest. Right, people could play because all the all the all the great imagination in the world doesn't do anything to you uh, if you can't uh, if people aren't going to be playing the game. Yeah. So, um, so which one's the chicken? Which one's the egg? It's hard to tell. <laughs> uh, but I did want to uh, this piece of trivia for the for the people to enjoy real quick. Um, 
in the 1800s, so 1826, I think, um, the Bronte children, so this was Charlotte and Emily and Anne and Branwell, are really credited with creating what we, mo at least for, in Western civilization, right? Just in Western, um, the first role-playing game experience. Uh, they, um, one of the sisters wrote Jane Eyre, another sister wrote another one of, another famous novel. So they were very creative, right? Mm -hmm. They're a very creative family. Um, and they created with toy soldiers and their imaginations, these sort of political, social, proto role-playing <clears throat> games that went on for decades, I understand. Interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and then, of course, you had um, uh, the, <clears throat> uh, like all the, the, the war games, and a lot of war gamers did become role-playing game people. Sure, yeah. Um, for, yeah, and, and that the say it's at roots, I don't know, maybe that's probably probably a broader gaming culture but also you know this is the late 60s early 70s mm -hmm. there's a fair degree of counterculture going on too that really comes into play with greg stafford and uh glorantha so runequest and things of that nature mm -hmm. <clears throat> which all eventually becomes uh um uh, chaosium one of the biggest biggest names in in Rome. yeah so um but here here's the thing that uh, Again, not to take us too deep a dive into history, but <clears throat> so D and D or O D and D, as they call it, original D and D, uh, comes out in seventy four. By the end of seventy five, there are, you know, ten more games. By the end of the decade, there's probably uh, another thirty published role playing games. So within there's very much all in the D and D umbrella. No, no, actually not outside the D&D &D umbrella. Okay. Um, or they were, a lot of them, like Tunnels and Trolls, is a bit of a reaction to uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. um, and just so for people know, if I mention a game, take that as me recommend, uh, not the Dallas game, I, I don't know anything about it. But take <laughs> me as that recommending to you to play it. From I'm, here on out. <laughs> right, yeah. Unless I say specifically, don't play this game. Uh, so, yeah, I encourage people to try them all. Nice. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it became a, a quick, like, underground comics, you know, mm -hmm. everybody started writing them. Yeah. Uh, and <clears throat> in a lot of ways, uh, that sort of first wave of game designers, um, you know, they were doing this stuff on mimeograph machines and on their typewriters or work, early word crunchers and things like that. Yeah. Um, but the, the influence of role-playing games gets heavy very quickly. I was watching, um, I know everybody's not a Movie Bob fan. Uh, but I like Movie Bob, <laughs> um, and he uh, he was doing a, a video on Star Wars, but he talked about all the things, all the uh, nerd stuff, I guess, uh, that was coming out at that time, around 75, 76, 77. Uh -huh. He mentions D&D as one of those things, and uh, he's right. So, I mean, if you think about it, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, fantasy fiction, um, is really starting to pick up. We, we kind of live in a day where we write it, <laughs> but yeah. um, we also, you know, we, we can go, you go to the bookstore and, and just slap a few books in, in your basket and go home and read them. Um, but it wasn't, you know, fantasy and science fiction were still very closely related and they weren't as prevalent, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as they are today. It wasn't easy to get to. So this is all sort of, this revolution in um, mediums and and creativity is all happening at about the same time. Mm -hmm. It's really fascinating stuff. Um, and it's very easy to catch, uh, like my friend Ron says, uh, um, the disease, right? The mm -hmm. designer disease. Um, so I got my first for Christmas, thanks, Dad, D&D uh, &D, um, basic, the Moldvay basic, I'm very specific about that, uh, the Moldvay basic game uh, in 81. <clears throat> By that summer, I decided that I, I needed to hack it and try to make something be better. <laughs> At the ripe old age of 10 years old, 
<laughs> um, but I was doing that with most of the games I had, uh, the role, uh, the role playing games, the war games, I would take the components and turn them into something else. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a, uh, uh, it's very easy to catch the design disease. Is it, is it because of the limitations of the storyline or is it more because it's just your, you want to build upon what is there or you, you get a different idea. Why is it, right. what, why does it catch the, the bug so quickly? Uh, it's very, uh, well, uh, the stories, uh, stories are sort of things that come after uh-huh. or emerge from play. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you can think of it as it's choose your own adventure, but there are no, ne- not at its best, there are no necessarily, there aren't any preconceived, don't you turn to page 34 and there's not anything written there, right? Yeah. It all It's all supposed to come out of what you do during play. Um, but so I think that the creative medium is what does that, mm. right? The first time you can sit down and <clears throat> you fight a goblin and you take damage and the spell caster throws a spell and the thief backstab or picks a lock and you're using your imagination to do it. You're not clicking any buttons. Um, you're, you're just rolling some dice and then you're describing your actions it, as a medium. I think it's very, very potent and very, mm-hmm. very inspiring. Right. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> nice. Uh, we do have a question here. I don't know how off off you want to get, but uh, sure, go ahead. The, the Chris asks, uh, with the advent of a, uh, VR and I guess Meta, do you see us moving towards something remotely similar to like a Ready Player One style of learning and playing? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I think the answer to that is sure. Um, <laughs> number one, I think that if you can VR with your group, so uh, the pandemic has been bad. I'm not in any way suggesting a pandemic is good. Um, but in a lot of ways, um, when it comes to breaking the, the habit or the, breaking the thought pattern that you have to be at the same table as someone. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were remote games before this. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, watching Critical Role uh, and um, who I may be critical of later, but I don't want people to think I don't like it. Mm-hmm. Um, Critical role, though, is a little different because they're all in the one room together. Yes, but. right, right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the idea though, you're 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 working together remotely. Right, right, right. Um, and so the addition of VR to answer Chris's question, uh, yes, I think that will definitely enhance things. Um, the problem that could arise um, is that uh, there'll be a temptation to subvert. Uh, subvert play in that regard in favor of the story, which happens quite a bit. Mm. Um, and I'm, I, I, I'm firmly in the um, let the dice or whatever fortune mechanic you have fall where it may, uh, not fudging dice. I mean, I don't roll in front of people mostly because I just like to, I like the secretness of the role. Um, but, uh, I think you reveal are, you reveal the role eventually, right? Yeah, you can. Right, yeah, I do that often. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, um, I think that VR can definitely it's a tool like anything, and I think that it can sort of be that next step where mm-hmm. instead of just sitting on a Zoom call together, we are actually um, playing in a virtual environment together. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, uh, Jin here, he lives in Japan. And he's saying, both being both a player and dungeon master, I found it hard to get a full commitment from players, though it may be due to living in a non-English speaking country. Absolutely, um, but I don't think that's the case. <laughs> uh, it, no, don't. Uh, so don't take it that way. No, the people are in the English speaking world are just as not committed uh, as anywhere else. Um, yeah. I think, uh, but I think that's not to get us too deep into the social commentary. Uh, we like to be busy these days because we have smartphones and smart computers and all sorts of ways to input into virtual uh, Mm -hmm. places. And I think it's hard to pull away Mm -hmm. expectations of change. And you know what? That's a great way to segue into some of the essentials. Cool. Um, So like time and space are things we've just been talking about. Right. Um, 
I used to be firmly because I grew up as a you know a preteen and then teenager when I didn't have to go to work or when I did go to work I could come home and stay up all night. Um, and in college, you know, you do pretty much yeah. whatever you want. Um, so time and space were a big deal. Yeah. So we could play for six hours, or like the the infamous, uh, we played six hours in one game, finished it, walked back because I lived in a hotel off campus. Um, walked back to my place at the hotel, and I started the next game <laughs> that night. So we played for six hours, took an hour break, played for another six hours until the sun came up. <laughs> um, and those days are long gone, even maybe even for kids in college, right? Um, or people in the military or, or in situations like that where they have free time, you know, it's just not, it's just not the same. Yeah. Um, so, uh, time has changed from four hours being standard. Let's get together and play for four hours. And you think you really can't get anything done in less than four hours. Yeah. But that's not true. Um, I've learned that two hours is plenty of, plenty of time to get a lot of satisfying play done. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking essentials, what people need to know or what need to have, if you can spare two hours a day, um, then you'll be in good shape. Mm -hmm. I promise you. So you what is critical do. role doing wrong? Because they go like eight, nine hours. <laughs> <sometimes. laughs> well, that's, that's how I got turned on to the, to the idea of Twitch being that model is that I was watching, well, actually first saw them on YouTube, but yeah. they've moved over to Twitch and they've taken it over with that. They really have. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, but critical role to a large degree um, is, especially now, is entertainment. Yeah. More than play. It used mm -hmm. to be, in my opinion, it was about half and half. Um, and that's fine. It's great. I mean, I, I think they're very engaging. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that they really care about the games that they're playing. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that it's... Yeah, they get into it. They're all actors. Do. Too, so. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. They're all actors. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that's how they play. Mm -hmm. Including the Dungeon Master. He's a really famous actor, actually. Yes. Yeah, yep. Voiceover guy. Um, Chris says our sessions were once a week, two-hour sessions, and you just had to take great notes. Yeah, absolutely. The two hour, people can't, don't think you can get a lot done in two hours, but you absolutely can. You and then he says can. that he played with a homebrew tabletop simulator and it was different, but almost the same as it feel like VR would change the game. I, I think so. Like I was mentioned before, I think that mm -hmm. it will. Everybody having a VR setup um, and then taking advantage of, um, what's the word? Uh, it's um, not alternate realities. Um, virtual? Well, yeah, virtual realities. And there's another word for it too. Um, but, uh, yeah, but taking advantage of those. You mean before. augmented reality? There we go. Augmented reality. Yes. That, I think that's where it's really going to hit is mm -hmm. when you can use augmented reality. Um, where you're kind of looking like your hand is like rolling the dice or something like that kind of. Right. Idea. Right. And where you can walk around in space mm -hmm. um, instead of just sitting down. Mm -hmm. um, but that was the, 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 the other essential place or the, the other essential I was going to mention is finding space to do it, mm -hmm. whether it's on a Zoom call or a uh, Teams call or, or whatever. Um, we used to play over IRC. People mm -hmm. remember that. You kids. <laughs> you kids who yeah, remember it. The, a the AOL, they had the ALL one where you could do that. And they, right, had, like, they had the little thing where you could t tap it and the dice would roll on their own and stuff like that and kind yep. of thing like that. Absolutely. Uh, you, uh, just along the lines of that space uh, uh, aspect, even on Zoom, though, the essentials are there, right? Everybody's got their spread on their table that you don't, you just don't see it, right? Right, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it, they, they do have crates, and it, it allows for some people who need to, you know, um, uh, Bob, uh, who, like, was always on the couch like this or over here. <laughs> well, Bob can now get into bob's comfortable space and yeah. so it, it allows them to be more uh more focused as a player so that's a good thing yeah interesting so you know find yourself two hours find yourself some space it's basically if you have enough space to sit around and roll or it's not all dice rolling but it's mostly dice rolling roll some dice on the table on a flat surface 
as long as that works for you, that's really what you need. Uh, oh, and Mountain Dew. You already that. <laughs> yeah, Sean was telling me earlier before we were on air that that's the essential gamer drink right there is the Mountain Dew. <laughs> Which I'm sure everybody in the crowd will concur. But <laughs> um, and I guess the most important, maybe the most important thing, I guess it is the most important thing, essential, is people. Um, there are plenty of solo games. Now, this is interesting too. Or it's interesting to me. I hope it's interesting to other by us. Uh, originally, a solo game, um, they have a bit of a, a reputation. Mm. Uh, a sort of a, ooh, a solo scenario. Where you played by yourself. Um, and as long as you were uh, honest with yourself, it was very enjoy it was enjoyable. But they were all great. <clears throat> um, recently, I've been introduced to the idea of when people say solo RPG, they just mean themselves <laughs> and one other person. Mm. So like a game master uh, and uh, a player. Although... Mm. Again, just so everybody knows my bona fides, I am firmly in the in the group that says all people at the table are players, even if one of them acts as a game master. We're all, mm. still all players. That's another one of those. I don't know if I'd say controversial, uh, but it's a it's a topic for debate. It's often debated. Is the GM a player? I say yes. So, all those. Is it, are they a player in a different way, or are they an actual player that moves along with the story of the game? Um. So that can vary. You know I mean? Are they the more game? like a narrator instead of like a player kind of idea? Is, is that the controversy that there's the narrator versus the character? Right, right. So the the, the game master has different um, authorities that mm -hmm. they have to, they, you know, um, they uh, and and so a lot of their responsibility comes in creating the situation that you're in. Um, are you in a dungeon? Is it a murder mystery? Are you in outer space? Are you in inner space? So that's the traditional game master uh, work job. Um, some games obviously go away from that. Um, uh, Craig Campbell of Nerd Burger uh, Games has Die Laughing, which has no GM. Um, so there are a lot of GM-less games out there. But that's a little bit... But, but I think actually that should reinforce my point. It's it's that not one person is taking on those game master responsibilities. It's all being spread around to everyone. So um, they're all, everyone is a player. Um, in some games, the, the game master though has a lot of responsibilities, whereas in uh, so other games, they do not. So... Hmm. Uh, we got some interesting comments here too. We, the, the Chris says we actually had what I thought was a great idea, but executed poorly. We started a word document and we were able to dictate our actions during each session and describe it. But we fell off after three sessions because it became hard to keep track of every player and they did not log anything and would have been a neat story to, written as a go. Yeah. Getting buy-in from everyone when you do something like that is important. Um, and that's probably the the appeal of being all together, right? Kind right, of. right, right. Yes, that that's true. Um, yeah. Or in you know, in a case of a lot of virtual um, recording, you know, you can record the session if everybody's cool with that, mm -hmm. and then go back and and take notes or go over what would happen. And then Jin has a question for you. She he asks. Uh, one of the aspects that I really love about D and D was building my character, painting the figure, the merging companies like W. TOC or TC and other fantasy game makers, do you think the entry level cost deny new players? Um, the answer to that is no. Um, I absolutely, Jin, I absolutely am with you. Uh, I love painting my figures, even though I'm terrible at it. Um, and that's not just me being self deprecating. No, I really am bad. Um, but I think that's part of the, the marketing idea of that. Uh, you know, TSR was as guilty as this as anyone, but they're, all the big companies are guilty of this. Now we see the the Kickstarters, right, that are going yeah. into the millions. Um, and people feel compelled to have all the books. And I, I had this internet argument. Um, 
with some of the the folks at Wizards of Coast, WotC. Um, and, uh, you know, they're saying, well, everything you need is in the free document. And there is a free version of D&D, for instance, you can buy. Uh, but my counter to that is like, well, why do you then do you have uh, us buying three $50 books, hardback books, if everything we need is in the free document? Obviously, everything you needed was in that document, but it's not everything that you wanted, right? Yeah. You know, people don't want to have to make up the buzzers and mm -hmm. whistles and, and cool toggles. They want that there for them already to be able to, to put together and play with. So it was a little disingenuous, you know, mm -hmm. saying that. Um, but no, Jen, I totally get with you. But no, you really do only need players, um, a, a, a way to take notes. That's another essential space time. Uh, and a means of resolving conflicts. Um, I mean, I guess you could play uh, the, the Wii boxing game every time it needed to roll something, but I would recommend it. <laughs> um, so, but you need some sort of fortune. So, is it, isn't that where the GM, though, really comes into play a lot? I mean, it, I would imagine with a GM less game, that would be a lot more difficult. To, to resolve things because everybody recognizes the GM as the authority, right? So, right. So that's what it, that's true. Um, but sometimes I can backfire on you, right? Yeah. When, sure. when, you, <laughs> when you, when you favor one player over another and it's not right or whatever. Well, yeah. When you favor one player or when the GM has too much responsibility, there's a, if there's 10 goblins and there's six of you, the GM is already outnumbered. So right. handing the, the game master more responsibility, uh, oh, people can't see the camera, more responsibility. <laughs> that's not really fair, right? That they already are responsible for all the other living, breathing, or undead, if not breathing, or oozes, creatures in the world. Um, and then handing them more responsibility on that top of that, it's, it's a lot for one person to do. Mm -hmm. So that's why the move is to break that cycle right the traditionally your gm is the one who uh scheduled the game so what game we're playing what uh what situation we're creating uh who's bringing what snacks where are we playing uh, you know so the the move has been lately in a, a once i got the hang of it i agreed with it um to disperse not just the game structure stuff but also the social uh responsibilities of game master and i think that that's where a lot of groups fall down or fall off mm -hmm. where a, a game master becomes uh whether intentional or not they become a dictator um and sometimes for the best of reasons right <laughs> i mean i say uh, players and i roll my eyes because i do a lot of gming that's sort of where i identify um uh, uh as a player i in the gm role but uh, yeah, so I'm like always oh, like uh, players. Come on, yeah. <laughs> um, you know what's wrong with you people? Yeah, <laughs> that's everything though. I mean, yeah. I mean, the nerd culture can get a little obsessive and a little bit toxic and a little extreme, but yeah. still, you yeah. know, that's everywhere. It, it's true, and um, you know, there are a lot of um, parallels between role-playing of role-playing game group session and and a music or jam session mm. um so if you can imagine where you're you know uh, one player is the bass player who's always sort of got things it might be the gm it might not be the gm uh, but that person sort of like got the rhythm going and then everybody else is all over the place and, and that can be a little bit frustrating at times <laughs> so. so so you were mentioning conflict and how to how to get past it so right so what is uh you know the essentials of conflict what is conflict conflict could be the store is locked conflict could be i'm interrogating this uh individual and um i want to know what they know conflict could be literal physical combat right you're you're fighting the proverbial goblin again uh you um uh or you're you're in a tank you're part of a tank crew uh, or you're in a spaceship, you're a Jedi Knight fighting a Sith Lord, uh, you're um, a, a fair knight trying to save the dragon from the bloody princess, that sort of thing. Uh, so all those 
Or it could be as simple as uh, my character would like to go to the donut shop and your character would like to go to the pizza parlor. <laughs> and how are we, we, we want to stay together. How are we going to fix this? Um, so where conflict resolution comes in is ideally when you get to the point uh, and there's a game called the pool, uh, a free game, uh, which I've been playing a lot of lately, um, which really does a great job, I think, of, of getting us of getting it down to the bare essentials. Mm -hmm. You know, you only roll for conflict resolution when you basically are out other options when you can't talk it or role play it out. Mm -hmm. So you roll dice, um, and if you, you succeed, you get a reward. And if you don't succeed, the game master then uh, doesn't punish you per se, but they 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 steer the narrative in a different direction. Mm. So, um, but at the heart of these games are conflict resolution. I think the role playing games are a power fantasy. At this point, it's a lot more diverse, mm -hmm. but it started as a Western, mainly Anglo Saxon power fantasy. It's it's. You really can't get around that. Um, and so conflict in the early, in the old days, uh, I'll try not to say that too much, was very much about combat, right? Uh, you wanted something, whether it was moral, ethical, doesn't, doesn't really matter. You want something, you go in, you fight somebody for it. Mm. Um, as they progress, uh, I think that more adventure, more pulp adventure comes into the games where it's not just about killing something. It's it's about uh, experiencing exciting things, you know, ex oh. exciting moments, <clears throat> and that's where uh, you know story can emerge from uh, authentically playing your character um, against whatever situation the game master has, and you know it sort of bounces. That's a term we use a lot. Is bounce? Um, it, it bounces. You know, in, in a what well, you know, in, often in random and unexpected ways. Um, so it's not really uh, a story in the sense that you're you've got an end goal and you're just rolling dice to see who lives and dies. Mm -hmm. It's you're presented with the situation, and then between your choices of the players and how the fortune or the, the resolution mechanics go, that determines what happens. Mm -hmm. Like you um, said, choose your own adventure. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, now, dice are not the only resolution mechanic, but let's face it, there's a certain uh, fetish to uh, dice collection, right? <laughs> right? Let me make you big on the screen so everybody can see that. So everybody can see that. <laughs> you don't need to see my face, you get to see the dice. Um, when I lived in Maryland, we had a blue plastic container, which was our dice just our dice rejects and that was easily three times as many dice as i had in there and those were just the rejects right those were not the dice we played with on a regular basis so that was um yeah it's one of the fun it's not essential but it is a fun uh part of the experience and so that's where i'm also gonna another central role playing is if uh Sometimes using the word fun can be misleading. We play had a terrible game, but everybody had a good time. That was fun. Eh. <laughs> All right, everybody had a good time socially, but the game was crap, and you need to be able to say the game was crap. But one of the fun social aspects to role-playing is the collection of fortune tokens, or IE dice. <laughs> um, there's a certain zen to it sometimes. You know, I... Um, <laughs> sort of, uh, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> uh, exactly, right. And people will take uh, dice with you know we um, we took dice in our so. I imagine ago. that this is kind of like being a a billiards player, right? Yes. You get your own stick, you got mm -hmm. your own chalk, you got you know you got you got the towel. So I imagine you would know, you kind of know who pros are because they bring their own stick, right? Or bowling, you know, you bring your own ball, bring your own your shoes, ball. you know, it's 
very similar, right? It's kind of that idea that you know who the real players are because they put them into a little glass case and they got the days in the right. right. Um, I had, I don't have them anymore. Sadly, they, they've been lost in, to time. Um, but I had specifics. So Ro- RuneQuest is a game that uses percentiles. You roll low, you succeed. You roll high, you fail. Um, and I had specific roll, roll uh, RuneQuest dice. I didn't use them for anything else. <laughs> these two dice, these two percentiles, uh, the green and the yellow, I used for uh, RuneQuest exclusively. Is that is that a feel thing? Is that how do you determine what what is going to work for? What is it? Just you had good good fortune with it, and you kind of kind of like stay with it. So I guess probably the, the case of yeah, let me because people love dice, so I'll pull some dice. <laughs> um, Here, James says he used to have a, a d twenty on me when I managed my old cafe, and when people would ask to take a smoke break, I'd give them the die and said. Fantastic. Have to be 15. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so my favorite die type is the D12. Nice. And uh, this set was given to me by a friend who passed uh, a few years ago. Um, that is fantastic looking. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice, it's, I don't know if you can hear it. Probably not, but it's got a nice weight to it. Hmm. Um, I have a brass. Give me a moment here. <laughs> Chris says that's the best. That's a pretty high AC for cancer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, there's one of my brass D12s. There we go. No, no, where's the D20? Well, it's 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 not showing up, so it doesn't want to show up. I know it's a die. It doesn't have. It doesn't really have feelings, but. You can't find it easy. Oh, wait a minute. Here we go. Uh, so this is in D and D terms. So this is my this is my. Uh, I'm going to in front of the camera so it'll focus. This is brass. It was given to me a gift by someone special. I have a lot of dice like that in here. I have a copper set too. That's that's like that. And um, this one kills players. <laughs> I mean, it kills characters. I've never I've never killed a player. <laughs> I promise. I up out there. <laughs> it might kill their feelings, but it doesn't kill them. Uh, um, the chat is having fun with the. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think that having fun with things like this is also like when you make a character or you're creating a, uh, a situation for people to explore, mm-hmm. absolutely take it seriously, but don't take the whole thing too seriously i've been do you, you know, have specific people that cannot that that you will only allow to touch those special dice or do you or oh die? nobody touches that one <laughs> well that's not true my daughter does but she's the only one <laughs> um yeah you really, you're really you're lucky i'll let you look at it right right, yeah, right. you guys get to look at it you didn't get to touch it, it so actually I, should, I, I forgive me i didn't answer your question yeah it's a feel thing uh-huh. So those particular dice, either because they were well used or because they came well used in a certain shape, I had very good fortune with them. So um, whereas, like, just like th- those who play sports, uh, people are superstitious about their dice. Take care, Jen. Have yes, a good day at work. Thanks, thanks, Jen. Thanks for being here. Um, so yeah, people uh, are very susp- superstitious about their dice. Mm-hmm. And Chris says one of the favorite things about D and D was it was writing the backstory and then literally rehearsing different voices until I found the right one for the character. <laughs> well, that's good too. Uh, I have a, a lot of voices that sort of come out. Now, mm-hmm. to be to be fair and blunt, you know, the voice is not the game, right? Yeah, it's just the that's the extra fun, right? That's so. the extra fun. I had, and forgive me, and I'm not going to do it because there are eight million New Yorkers and only one of me. <laughs> uh, but we were I've, we were playing recently a game of Mothership. Um, probably last it was last year, so it's been a little bit. And my my character was a um, a blue collar worker, and named Vince. And <laughs> Vince uh, had a I think it was a Brooklyn accent. I don't know for sure, but I think that's what it was. I didn't rehearse it; it just sort of came out. And every time I played Vince, because that's just 
what the character seemed like he should be uh, when he came out. So that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so moving forward with other do you have other essentials or yeah so um we have time and space and people you have a, a re, you have a means of conflict conflict resolution you have fun you have the fun social and uh, personal uh, pieces that you can do because like any art form um and it's not just the making of games it's the art form it's the playing of games that's the art mm. um and that's I, I think that's why people are fascinated by the idea of watching right mm. um the only downside is that when you know you have an audience you sort of you could be um what's the word uh well you're always aware that the audience is watching right mm. so you're Never really, shy yeah camera shy or you know you could play to the audience mm -hmm. with that you know if they if they laugh at when your jokes you're gonna keep doing that thing right yeah. um and so that might that might skew the authenticity of play and i know i'm sounding like a kind of a uh, no like a you know you know it's funny because <laughs> the, the gm of critical role said that whenever they do it live it's a lot harder yeah. to get through it because the audience does react and you hear it and you hear yes. it live you know, and they don't they don't pay as much to the comments because the comments are going a million miles an hour. So they because right. there's thousands of people that watch it uh, uh, live all the time. So you know, it's not like here where we we have a few people watching and you can easily grab the comments. They they don't they don't uh, go that slow. <laughs> and right. so, but when they're doing it live, and then people yell things out or you know uh, you know comment and that would throw them off and so he doesn't really like to do the live ones very often because that's kind of kind of throws off the game he likes the purity of the game kind of idea so absolutely no i i absolutely understand. yeah matt mercer uh very talented and he's right mm -hmm. about that um you know it can mess definitely mess with you um so like a convention games we haven't really talked about convention convention gaming is very big yeah and a lot and dnd D &D in particular um moved a lot of uh product and gained a lot of um social or social currency at conventions right yeah. and that's sort of playing at conventions sort of that a lot of people got the idea of that's exactly how you should play the game so that was they were very influential in that way but it's the same deal unless it's late at night or uh in the morning and there's not a lot of people around you'll hear the people playing mm -hmm. people will watch people will kibitz um uh and it and it does affect the game right it is one of those things at a convention that you you try to overcome a lot of people go will go up to someone's hotel room for instance mm -hmm. to avoid all that well at dragon con they just lay out on the floor i like i almost or walked that. into one that i didn't even realize was a game until like somebody said oh you're gonna step on the game i'm like oh shit. You know? <laughs> but they just lay out right on the hotel floor lobby and just play so. right yeah oh no yeah you can uh as long as like I said, as long as you find the space to roll some dice or whatever the fourth <laughs> mechanic is, yeah, you're good. Yeah, I, uh, I would have to imagine there's something comforting about just laying down and playing D D too. <laughs> yeah, there really is, right? It's 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 a lot of things. It's it's entertaining. It's it's a medium. It can be zen, but it can also yeah. be fun as hell for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so we have time, and you have space, mm -hmm. you have fortune, you have people. Um, you need a system. And you know we talk about D and D a lot. Mm -hmm. um, fun fact for you D and D players or people who don't know a lot about it. Um, you know, back back in the day, see, I did it again. Uh, but in the seventies, you really had two games, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you had the original D and D, and then for various reasons we don't really need to get into, uh, you had a D and D, right? Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. And people got the idea that the basic D and D, which split up, was sort of the baby game, and that's not true. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we're talking about: three versions of basic D and D, plus the rule cyclopedia versions. That's four, and old D and D. That's five, <clears throat> and then you have a D and D one, two, and then D and D three, four, and five. So you have ten versions of this game, and people. You know, or think, oh, D D fifth edition, right? No, no. 
<laughs> it's more like D&D &D 10th edition <laughs> is what you're playing with. And then, of course, you have the movement, um, the old school renaissance mm -hmm. um, or old school revolution or old school whatever they want to call it, the OSR, um, who harken back to <clears throat> the original or some of the basic versions of the game. Mm -hmm. So those are even more variations and offshoots. So you were talking earlier about the D and D umbrella, and it exists, right? There, when the OGL, the the Open Gaming License, came out around third edition, so this is two thousand, mm -hmm. it really exploded. It uh, the industry boomed, right, for a minute. Yeah, um, and the hobby boomed, and more people got into it. Um, and there was an explosion of games. Um, and around 96, I think I'm correct about this, or 99, <clears throat> somewhere in there, wherever the PDF was uh, invented, or wherever the PDF came to the forebear, and I think, I know Ron made a PDF. That's yeah, around 96-ish. Yeah, so, so uh, it was Sorcerer that was available in PDF. Um, if you haven't played Sorcerer, I highly recommend it. Go get it. Um. And uh, so um, that also led, you know, we're talking, we're, we're indie folks here. So let's talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. um, as we move on, you know, in essentials, um, you need a system, right? And there are a lot. So when uh, it became possible for you and me to mass market a game, with PDFs, where before, if you or I wanted to create our uh, our RPG, and the term for these often is, is fantasy heartbreaker, it's a big in the 90s, mm -hmm. we might have to mortgage our home <laughs> for enough money to buy 300 copies of Sean's fantasy monster nightmare, mm -hmm. the RPG. And then I'd go to Gen Con or some other con convention convinced that I was going to sell out of those 300 copies, pay, be able to pay my mortgage, and then, <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't happen, it's right? Like it never happens. <laughs> Us as indies know that all too right. well, everything else that we do. <laughs> right, yes, right, exactly. Um, I'm not aware of any vanity RPG presses that ever popped up. Like, mm. yeah, they did interesting, that would be interesting. That would be a weird thing. Yeah, I <laughs> You pay us X money and we'll print your book for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I guess probably Vanity Presses. I'm sure somebody know. used it for that purpose, maybe. Yeah, I'm sure they probably did. Um, but once we get the PDF, everything changes. Mm. Around 2000, in a big way, people who were just sort of uh, doing uh, indie systems, uh, what we would consider non or non traditional publishing systems. Um, had PDFs and they could sell them. They could sell them online and make, you know, you put, you, you get your time into it and a little bit like maybe you needed page maker or at the time it's uh, in uh, InDesign now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, and then suddenly, you know, you can, you can pump those PDFs out right and left. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, sorry, getting back to the essentials. I know we're, we're getting short here. Um, so time and space and people, uh, fun, uh, a, a way to resolve conflicts, and you use system. Mm -hmm. um, the D20 system or the 5E system, whatever you want to call it nowadays, is pretty useful. Uh, you, you put a lot of work. The, the more work you put into it, the more you'll get out of it. Yeah, sure. Um, but really all you need for system is a, a coin flip. Heads. <laughs> Heads, you hit the goblin. Tails, <laughs> you miss the goblin. And that's really all you need. Um, and everything really is kind of a variation of that. Although I, I think the math mathematically suggests that 3D6, systems that just use 3D6, either rolling low or rolling high, uh -huh. uh, are the uh, mathematically most elegant way to do that because of the bell curve and how, mm. how it goes. Let's just see. So you have three. So if you have three d six, two friends, uh, two hours, uh, a pencil and paper, uh, <laughs> a, something to roll your dice on, you've basically got everything you need to, for a role playing game. So, 
Um, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. It's good. Well, then Chris, Chris, uh, I've been waiting to pop Chris's question in here, and he says, when playing a, any role playing game like those, how do you go about introducing new players? With what baby steps do you use to engage them in the theater of the mind they need these uh, these games need? That's a great question. Um, I think there are two avenues that I would suggest. One, or all three, really. Mm -hmm. Number one, um, right off the bat, if the game is about monster hunting, for instance, uh, you can have them fight a monster. Because that's the juice of the game, right? Yeah. Um, you know, um, call your little gobble buddy over and say, all right, buddy, I'm gonna I'm gonna sacrifice you for the new players. Get them into the juice of what their characters do. If the game is about um uh okay so paul sega's uh i played a paul Se paul sega game the other day uh that was about adventurers coming back to the city um and just essentially not exploring the city as much as exploring what they could do their urges in the city get right to doing that right mm -hmm. if it's if it's about the game is about photography Shout out to Mike Holmes from years and years ago. Uh, if the game is about photography, have them take pictures right away. Don't start them in a nightclub. Don't start them in their, their bedroom. Um, just get them into the thing that's supposed to do. Um, get them salivating about playing the game. Right. Yeah. Get them salivating about playing the game. Yes, absolutely. Um, use a system that's relatively easy to grok. Um, the pool, for instance, you roll dice. All you need is one, one on all the dice you roll mm -hmm. to succeed. That's it. And there's no question. There's no waffling about that. You roll, you get one success, you're in. You're good. Um, and uh, I guess the third way I would think about it is uh, for games that, because uh, there are a lot of games that have an IP, a strong IP mm -hmm. worth. There's a Middle Earth. It's called the, the current version of that is the One Ring, uh, which I quite a, uh, again. That's something I can recommend. I like playing that. <clears throat> um, you know what is the essentially token thing to do? That's what they're there for, right? People, uh, uh, people come to role playing games because they want to do a thing. They play Pendragon. Don't never get me to play that game, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> the, the token. Okay, gotcha. Uh, but like, if, if you're, they're fans of Arthurian legend play Pendragon, mm -hmm. right? And get them doing Pendragon things. What is that? You know, whatever those things are, quest it, nice questing, get them doing that. Makes sense. Yeah. So if it's about uh, the um, My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic RPG. <laughs> uh, yes, I am also recommending you play that. <laughs> um, but if it's, so it's about ponies and friendship, right? It's about magical pony friendship. Well, get them into doing that right away. The sooner you get them being magical ponies, the better. Um, <clears throat> try not to make character creation laborious. Um, and, and, you know, I'm someone who tends to play rules as written as much as I can, or rules as, you know, whatever we decide the rules are going to be, that's what they're going to be. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't mean you have to hit them with every rule right <laughs> away, right? <laughs> like, okay, so let's... <laughs> It's not a it's not a legal document, okay? It's you're not all right, turn to page five, paragraph nine, price of swords. Right? <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. Because they will never if they don't get up and leave right away, or if they're if on they camera. Like, about it. <laughs> they're like, oh my my camera is dying. Oh, I can't play, yeah. sorry. Oh, um, this is an important phone call. Nobody's calling me, but there's an important phone call I gotta go. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. People will not come back. And you can always know when you're uh, when you're losing folks, when they don't know what to do, of course, yeah, right. And they're just sort of sitting there, like oh, I don't know what to, you know. And they don't even say it, but you can see it on their faces, I don't know what to do. <laughs> um, so give them something to do. <clears throat> That's the best way. Once they start pass or fail, once they start resolving conflicts and getting involved in conflicts, right? Um, you know, often and oftentimes it's when they fail. Mm -hmm. that's really interesting and they're like oh oh i failed well what am i doing to do now mm -hmm. that usually will hook players mm -hmm. yeah 
Do you make them go first or do you kind of let them see how, like make them go last to see how everybody else plays it? Oh, well, no, I will definitely, um, for new players, I'll try to get them involved immediately. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if we're playing D&D, &D, for instance, um, or we're playing Sorcerer, which is a game about, so, uh, you know, you're a literal sorcerer in the modern day with um, demons, I will get to you into a conversation with your demon. Right. right. Um, you know, your demon's pissed off because you, you haven't done the thing that it, it feeds off of. And Joe, I, I need to go do my thing. You know, I need you to do some sorcerer <laughs> stuff. Uh, so I'll immediately launch into those kind of things. And, and, and uh, just to, to put a, a uh, cross our I's and dot our T's, um, new players, not all new players, but even the most introverted likes it when you sort of fo not, not necessarily hyper focus on them, mm -hmm. but you know, you, you like, Hey, you're in this game. I see you, you know, and it help. It also helps you gauge massage them a bit. Yeah. It helps you gauge their comfort level. Right. Yeah. Um, do they want a little attention or a lot of attention? So that, that, that's very helpful to you, but it all, it usually will draw somebody into the game. Mm -hmm. Right. Nice. Well, just to mention real quickly for Mr. Chris there, uh, he's going to be attending Multiverse, and uh, you should uh, go upstairs to the game. Well, we don't know if it's upstairs yet or not, but but is it? Well, do you know that? Is it, is it going to be upstairs again? Oh, so the, game, the gaming column will be where I was doing panels last year. Okay. Which makes so, sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, so was that upstairs? I yeah, well, you were there the last year. You were upstairs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that yes. first, that first, the first right off the elevator bank there. That was right. where you guys were. And I would highly recommend Chris if you want to come hang out. That that that, that you'll get a game going there if you wanted to do that. So, For sure, yeah. we're going to also be running a lot of demos at Multiverse, um, yeah. and definitely there will be demoed role playing games. Yeah. So that means people be will come and they'll be able to get involved. We'll have pre generated characters for you. Um, and you know, but we'll and also you bring have... your own characters into the game if you're sure. if you know the game you're playing, and you you can you have already established yourself in in a different different gameplay, but you want to play with that character. Sure, absolutely. I think that'd be great. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's a great idea. Actually, we'll have some open play as well. You know, bring your character. Uh, that's a great idea. Actually, I'm stealing <laughs> Joe's idea. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we'll have demos, we'll have panels, and we'll have. Panels. I just know how long you work on those things. So sometimes, you know, you get you get it into a groove, like your die. You know, you you played specific die for certain things because you got into a groove with them. So it's yeah. kind of that superstitious kind of aspect of it, right? So, right. Everybody has their favorite character. There's mm -hmm. a uh, great web comic, um, Knights of the Dinner Table, mm -hmm. and so the one character, Dave. Uh, uh, I can't remember who's who, who, or maybe it was no, it's not Dave. It's the other guy who's Knuckles. Knuckles, the fourth or fifth or twentieth. Uh, you know, he's he's always essentially the same character, no matter mm -hmm. what he's playing. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Some people are like that. Some yeah. people have a. Uh, um, they just have a cover zone. Yes, exactly right. They have their comfort zone, and so that's the last thing I'm going to mention. Essential is have some chill, because I've been that intense. Yeah, it was just like I can't believe this character. You have this. You made this this character, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, yeah. So have some chill, have some respect. <clears throat> if if the DM is running a cyberpunk game, you bringing in uh, um, the guy from um, Sherlock Holmes or something, or Sherlock Holmes or or um, <laughs> from Aliens. Freak. Link, yeah. <laughs> Link. If you bring in Link from like Breath of the Wall or, or Ocarina of Time, yeah. that character is not thematically. Yeah. Yeah, don't bring in Han Solo. <laughs> right. right. You can play a Han Solo like character, but do not bring in actual Han Solo. Uh, so, but have some chill, right? Just, just don't take it too seriously. And to know, be like... honest with you, that is the thing. As a somebody looking from the outside in, uh, you know, I, I'm self-professed novice here. Uh, and, that is the thing that has always incited me from not participating in those games. <laughs> it's like, what's wrong with this guy that he has 200 dice? Well, no, no, not, not even that. I, I get all that. That I get, you know, 
being a baseball fan and superstition and all that. I get all that. Yeah. What what I don't what I what I normally it is the toxicity and the the way in which people play and I've seen it like Critical Role does a really good job of getting this chill people and and usually they have if they have somebody like that they usually weed them out and get them out of there really fast right. although they are very serious about their gameplay. Right. It's the one thing that really kind of gravitated me toward watching it was I enjoyed the storytelling aspects and I enjoyed the acting and everything like that. So it was because it was chill, but I've watched D and D games of my friends and I've seen my friends participate in, I had a friend who participated in one online on a Facebook live and they just destroyed them. They just destroyed her be, because she didn't, she didn't fit into how they wanted to play the game. She was doing her own thing because she's very talented at doing that. Right. And, and it, 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 she doesn't play anymore because of that, you know. Mm. And it, a lot it, of people it, have been driven away by the by toxic assholes. You should run a one shot. <laughs> you know, I think we could do, if 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 Joe, you want to do that. Absolutely, we can win a run shot one day and okay. uh, let people watch. Absolutely, yeah, sure. I'm I'm down for it. I'm down for playing. I I would love to get more action on my Twitch actually for to do that, but it's just like you know, I I just, again. Like I said, it's it's really difficult to you feel like an outsider in a lot mm -hmm. of these things, and that's that's a hard thing for somebody. Even for me, as extroverted as I am, uh, I still feel that I feel like I'm not if I'm not doing it right, why do it? You know, kind of thing. You well, know? sure, I get that. I absolutely do, absolutely. Agree. But I'm I'm a great um, I'm if if nothing else, I'm a great missionary for role playing games. Mm -hmm. I feel like it. There's a game out there for everyone, mm -hmm. um, and that even if it's something you enjoy for two hours a month, mm -hmm. uh, you know I guarantee you with the right people, it's it's going to be a great two hours every month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a I'm a I'm an avid card player, and I love playing cards. So yep. like that's a that's a very similar idea. You yes, know, it sim is. similar Absolutely. feel to it, and. And, you know, I will say having visited your track and being there and talking to a couple people that were there at the time I was there, it was very, it was very open. And they were telling me, you know, I was asking them, what game should I start with? How should I start? And they were very, very friendly to do that. And that's, yep. uh, that, that almost got me to sit down and play, but I had other things to do. <laughs> <laughs> but I, like I told you last year, uh, I, one of my goals this year is to not only uh, visit you know, visit you guys, but to be there and actually play something for the, for, for a time period. And, and the other thing is to go to the crafts room and make something that those are the two things I didn't get to do last year that I really gotcha. wanted to do this year, but yeah, yeah no, absolutely. You just let me know when we'll, we'll make it happen. But yeah, this is, uh, I mean, if you got more, please, we've got plenty of time. You, you don't have to worry about the time. So that's, if you want uh, to go over a couple more things, let's uh, yeah, really just, that's, that's it. Um, I will, uh, if, uh, I'll just let folks know, this is, of course, my personal, these are all my personal opinions. <clears throat> a lot of people I respect may disagree with some aspects of it, and that's okay, right? I'm totally okay with them, with, mm -hmm. but I think most people would probably agree these are the basics, time, space, people, fun, uh, resolution system, um, chill, and, you know, uh, have, a, have a situation in mind. Um, I had a discussion a couple of years ago about I think that most people come to role playing games because they want that moment. Mm. I want to. I want to chop off. Uh, yeah. Somebody's head or, <laughs> I need some catharsis in my life, right? <laughs> right. Or you know, taking games. Maybe the game is about playing cards, right? Right. And so right. you want that. Uh, you want to pull that <clears throat> royal. You want to say gin. Or you want to say gin. <laughs> um, you know, I, one of my favorite movies. Um, that I don't really watch enough of, but the sting, right? Uh, I mean, imagine being able to in con, a role playing con. game con <laughs> the people like that, the con, the con, and yeah. that's got to be fantastic. So I think yeah. people pick for those moments. So hey, you know, always have a good situation in mind. I mean, and don't be afraid to steal. Uh, Matt Colville, who whose channel is mostly about D and D, but mm -hmm. almost everything he says is goes for any game. Yeah. Um. You know, he, he's like, I steal stuff from people all the time. And it's true. You <laughs> steal stuff from people, right? Yeah. Put four people, put five people in a spaceship, kill one of them with an alien, 
<laughs> and see what happens. Yeah. Um, I, I promise you there will be mayhem. And uh, we sort of did that at uh, JordanCon. That was our charity RPG. I ran the Alien RPG. <laughs> and by the end of the Alien RPG, two, people were shooting at each other, right? I mean, they killed the alien, but they were also then shooting at one another. And it's, that's the weird stuff that can happen in a role playing game. You know, they're not they're not all heroes, right? Don't don't be don't think that you always have to be heroic. Now, if they're indie creators and you're stealing from indie creator, make sure you give them credit, right? That's the oh one yeah, thing. absolutely. If that's the caveat I would say. If, uh, right, if you're going to put something in your game, let's look at most uh, uh, a lot. A lot of indie creators have community uh, the uh, the community commons or mm -hmm. uses the OGL, whatever. Um, but yeah, you know, if you're going to design a game, if you're actually going to get into the publishing side of it, absolutely. Give people good credit where it's due. Yeah. If you're running a, something like this on a stream, mm -hmm. even if only a hundred people are watching and you, you've taken an idea, be honest about that. No one's, I, I promise you, no one is, is no one's sending yeah, the copyright it, police after you. No, it's, it's, it's all, it's a very welcoming community in that respect. Yeah. Yes, it is. Chris is right. Matt Mercer does this very well on talking about how he wants, to, how do you want to do this? And when players finally succeed, it's the carrot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How do you want to, oh, you killed the bad guy. Tell me how you did that. Mm -hmm. And, and in some games, that's part of um, the authority for someone. Um, I hope I'm using the term outcome authority lays in their hands. Mm -hmm. And and uh, you know, tell me how you want to do this and that sort of thing. So nice for nice. sure. <laughs> um, I guess I'll just end up with a couple of my favorites. Oh, I, I promised a Star Wars story, so I will yeah, say. yeah. Tell us the Star Wars story. Sure. So uh, West End Games, which is sadly no longer uh, in business, uh, in eighty seven ish, I believe eighty six eighty seven published the Star Wars D six, um, and. Of the role playing game fans who, you know, Star Wars fan, role playing game players, that Venn diagram where they really come together, um, most people still consider that to be the best Star Wars game. But he and here's the apocryphal or urban legend version it's that game plus Timothy Zahn's trilogy of, of novels that you can thank for all the Star Wars stuff you have today. Because the three movies were done, there wasn't that much interest in it. And here comes uh, Timothy Zahn, who writes three incredible novels, in my opinion. Um, they're not just good Star Wars novels, they're, they're well-written novels. And uh, then Star Wars D6, you know, people, there's supplements come out for it, and, and source books, and all the mechanisms of the corporate machine um, put out this pretty damn good role-playing game. And so you have these forces coming together that create enough interest in the prequels, in the animated series, in the sequels, in the yada, yada, yada. So um, that, there's your, your apocryphal story that, that role-playing games helped save Star Wars. Which then George Lucas completely ignored, and then subsequently J.J. Abrams completely ignored. <laughs> right, yeah. They created this really great... Uh, pseudo canon or uh, meta canon or whatever you want to call it that basically yeah they're just like ah this is too creative we don't do that <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah uh, you know um, those are really the essentials of what you need to role playing game uh, a lot of times you'll say and an imagination <laughs> Everybody's got an imagination. Yeah, I would just, think that's probably attached to you already. <laughs> right. Well, that's why. I, that's why I think you know, stealing ideas. Uh, uh, if you're, um, I think there's a Transformers RPG out there somewhere. You yeah. know, if you're a Transformers fan, you don't you don't have to come up with the background. You already know what Prime yeah, yeah. With Prime and does. So you have that information already. Uh, well, there was a Teenage Mutant Mutant. Ninja Turtle game. Yeah, you already had all the background you needed. Uh, all you needed was those rules to help you uh, codify it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Don't, don't don't feel like you don't have an imagination. You do. There's a game out there for everybody. There's a game out there for everybody. 
That's awesome. I love to hear that. That's fantastic. And there's probably an indie game out there for everybody too. Uh, more so. Yes, absolutely. No, that that is. Yeah, there's an indie game out there for you. Trust me, there really is. <laughs> awesome, sir. Anything else you want to add on real quickly or anything? Um, you know, I um, I do. I, if it's okay, I, I belong mm -hmm. to a community at uh, Edit Play Edit Play dot com. Hold on, mm -hmm. let me get the URL. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, adaptplay.com. We do a lot of, uh, when we say actual play, we mean not necessarily recorded, although a lot of it is recorded. We talk a lot of game theory and design theory over there. It has a Discord, it has a website. Um, mm -hmm. If you're interested, just reading people talk about their gaming experiences, um, you know, new people are always welcome at adaptplay. Uh, and Ron will tell you where I, where I got everything I said here wrong. But that's okay. <laughs> That's okay. He's a, uh, you know, it's a good community of people. So. Nice. Awesome. Well, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this for us. This was really fantastic, really informational for me. Um, really, uh, really got me interested in doing this. So good. I think that's pretty cool. And I think that's really neat. And uh, yeah, you explained it very, very well. So I really, really good. appreciate that. And, yeah, no, no problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm so. always happy to talk about it. Always happy to talk about it. Yeah, the, Chris says, great show. Thank you so much. Thank so, you very much. Yeah. So do you want to say the magic words to take us out? Do you know the magic words? It's always time to go Indy now. Oh, it, no, I don't know. What are they? What are they? It's always time to go Indy now. Oh, it's always time to go Indy now. 